many of us barely realize, but the abundance that our society is able to provide is creating problems that we have to address similarly to how we have addressed problems of scarcity in the past. My name is David Orban and this is The Context, Season 4, Episode 10. The most fundamental scarcity or abundance that we know and recognize readily is that of food. Humanity's history has been characterized forever by a scarcity of food and famines were common, population couldn't grow or declined or even went extinct in certain geographical areas. Only more recently, in the 20th century, we have been able to apply new tools that provided ample food for everyone. Today, when people don't have to, enough to eat, is not a question of not being able to produce enough, it is a question of not being able to distribute it to them. And those of us who luckily live in an environment where there is plenty food available have realized new challenges, like in my own case, eating too much, not being able to face and address a world of abundance, just as we would have been ill-equipped to address a world of scarcity. This is just one example, and there are others. Has it ever happened to you uh, to sit down tired after a day of work and spend a disproportionate amount of time going through the plentiful options of what to watch, um, whether to watch a short series, an episode, whether to watch a movie, in particular, what movie, did it ever happen that you ended up spending so much time, maybe 30 minutes or more, that you didn't watch anything. This is also an example of abundance and our inability to efficiently and effectively address the challenge of abundance. Another is represented by knowledge and learning. Incredible amounts of knowledge are available readily and we sometimes don't know what to pick, what direction to go, where to apply our passion, what to support and nurture our talents with. And we feel almost paralyzed by this abundance of choice. The tools that we must use and perfect are starting to be available. These tools have been available in the past as well. If you go in a supermarket, you are being manipulated by the physical display of those goods that uh, the various producers together with the manager of the supermarket want you to buy. And the way to um, help you, quotation marks, address the abundance of choice may or may not be to your ultimate advantage. Maybe the supermarket will let you buy something that is more expensive or they have a higher margin on. Maybe the choices that you will make are not going to be the healthiest if we are talking about buying food, for example, in the supermarket itself. Now, a lot of 
commerce happens online. And of course, when you go to Amazon, the algorithm will show you the results of your search based on all kinds of parameters, not all of them working in your favor. When you pick a movie to watch, when you want to listen to the next song in an automatically generated playlist, similarly, there are algorithms and filters that will mediate in this super abundance of choices that is now available to you. So, the tools that I am talking about are those the tools that these algorithms implement themselves, the filters that are necessarily there. They are not. I believe that we have to go to at least one level beyond. We have to learn and understand how the filters work. We have to learn and understand how the ranking algorithms are presenting the choices in order to induce us to make certain ones rather than others. Only then we will be able to evaluate if the results of those filters and rankings and recommendations are going in the direction that we share and understand and accept and adopt. Only then, as it is likely, when we realize that some of the rankings and some of the filters are suboptimal, we will be able to intervene and move them and nudge them in the right direction. Ideally, we should have the possibility of alternative filters that we could apply and compare objectively the results of one against the other simultaneously so that we can then make a judgment. Now, obviously, if there are many of these filters and algorithms, then comparing them manually is cumbersome. So, yes, it is natural for an algorithm to compare the rankings and the filters and present the list that it believes is the best for us based on the criteria that we have to be able to discuss and to specify and present to the algorithm ranking the algorithms. This is a kind of evolutionary process. And we have to understand that the cost of living in a world of abundant choices is the investment we have to make in learning about and managing the algorithms that manage the algorithms that manage our choices. Yes, there is an alternative of monastic discipline, renouncing the rich variety, whether in food, whether in travel and environments, whether in culture and nurturing curiosity and interest and learning about the world. And yes, some people aim to embrace this kind of letting go and voluntarily restrict oneself to something that is manageable, however poor it is indeed. But how many, after aiming to do that, actually are able to sustainably implement that? Well, by definition, the monks, and if you look at a society and the percentage of any society that is made up of monks, you realize that this alternative is not going to be ever embraced by a sizable amount of people. 
So yes, a world of abundance is now here and it is going to be available to more and more people in every part of the world. And we have to learn how to live together with this abundance in many areas. If we don't, well, the quality of our life will decline. Paradoxically, not only when we live in a world of scarcity, but also when we live in a world of abundance. We want quality to increase, so learning about this world is the only way to make sure that we progress rather than regress. Thank you for following this episode of The Context. If you like it, I invite you to become a fan, a supporter, a benefactor on Patreon at patreon.com slash David Orban.